This is ACMED TV and I'm Christoph Specht, your host. I have another very distinguished interview guest here by my side is Dr. Patrick Harris from Brisbane, Australia. You're an infectious disease specialist, you're a physician and a microbiologist. Correct. That's a very interesting combination. It is indeed. The How? Best, best of both worlds. Uh, obviously. How did you get into that? Uh, that's a good question. So I'm actually from the UK originally. Um, but um, I studied for a diploma in tropical medicine as part of my training in the UK. Where did you do that? Uh, that was in London. In London, because I did it in Liverpool. So. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, rivals. Um, <laughs> right. oh, not really. <laughs> so, so after that, I went to work in Malawi for, uh, for a year. Yeah, been there um, as well. <laughs> yeah, in, in Blantyre, you know. Yeah, that? right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I got very interested in tropical medicine and uh, obviously a lot of HIV work at that time when they were sort of introducing antiretrovirals. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting because I, I also was beginning to notice the impact of antibiotic resistance, particularly in the developing world. You know, when we were working in Malawi, we had maybe penicillin, maybe chloramphenicol, if gentamicin mm -hmm. if you're lucky, uh, but definitely not meropenem, yeah. very hard to get keftraxone certainly not new expensive antibiotics and we were beginning to see children with like severe neonatal, neonatal sepsis mm -hmm. with multi-resistant salmonellas or multi-resistant E. coli, uh, the introduction of ESBLs causing severe sepsis and in, in that sort of situation these things are absolutely untreatable and I've always I guess considered antibiotic resistance in this sort of global context. You yeah. know, we worry about it in the developing world, but we sort of have the resources to manage it in many ways. Right. Probably where its greatest impact is going to be is in Asia, Africa and places developing where they don't country. have the infrastructure to really right. manage that. And in just a, virtually a minute ago you presented a very interesting paper on the Merino trial. That's right, I've just, just come from there. Um, so for the last three, nearly four years I've been working on a a multi-center randomized trial that we've been conducting out of Brisbane. Really trying to answer the question, um, when you have patients that have these multi-resistant organisms in their bloodstream, so these things called ESBL producers, these are these enzymes that break down keftraxone or other penicillin type antibiotics. We sometimes find that they test susceptible in, in the laboratory to a drug called piperacillin tazobactam. Mm -hmm. and that's a very common drug that we use for severe sepsis and, and patients in intensive care. And it normally works very well for your standard organisms. But we've always been a little bit doubtful about whether they would work against these more resistant gram-negative organisms. Um, and there's been some observational data over the last few years that suggest they might be safe and they might be an alternative to carbapenems. And carbapenems are great antibiotics, but over the years there's been increasing use of carbapenems, and probably the greatest antibiotic threat that we face at the moment is carbapenem resistance mm -hmm. in our common gram negatives wow. like E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas. Um, and what we need is to sort of define alternatives to carbapenem so we don't always have to rely on these for these more severe infections in an attempt to try and reduce selection pressure for this carbapenem resistance. So the idea was can we use this alternative drug mm. as, as an, another option instead of using carbapenems all the time when the thing looks susceptible in the lab. Right. Um, really we, as I said, we've had some observational studies some have been supportive of this idea, some have been contradictory. No one has been that sure. And when right. you have that uncertainty, that sort of clinical equipoise, the best way to address that question is in a randomized That's trial. The, mm. um, the difficulty is though, as you know, most randomized trials come from the pharmaceutical industry. They're often extremely expensive, they're extremely complicated to do. Um, they can take many, many years to organize. And they often don't necessarily target the kind of questions that a clinician really in everyday to. practice yeah. needs to know. Right. Yeah. Um, so we were trying a different approach. Mm -hmm. And this was to firstly use generic drugs. So these drugs are cheap, they're available on the market, they're not, it's not like a registration trial for the FDA mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. EMA. These are, these are drugs that have been around for years, we know how they work, we know about their toxicity. 
what we're thinking about is how can we use them in a different way and what sort of strategy. And we designed a protocol, uh, we might call it a very pragmatic protocol, so closely resembling clinical practice, the kind of thing that we would do every day. So you could fit this trial into your routine work. So it wasn't a massive burden on the investigators and in that way we were sort of relying on their goodwill and their expertise and time to get this study done rather than having to pay them thousands and thousands of dollars to bully them into it. Right. So that was our concept. So obviously had many, many centres. Yeah, so we had, um, we had 26 hospitals in nine countries across the world. We tried to select from a variety of different um, geographical regions, different levels of economic kind of um, development. So we had sites uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore was probably one of our biggest recruiting sites. Um, and Singapore is a very interesting place because they have sort of a nexus of resistance that comes from China, Indonesia, the uh, the Middle Pots, East. That's thing. right. And so it's a very interesting place, I think, to do those sort of studies. But they also have quite a sophisticated healthcare system that can sort yeah, of run sure. these studies. But we also thought it was important to go to places like South Africa, Turkey, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia. Um, so places where they may have a very different spectrum of patients, different spectrum of disease, and different organisms disease and different well. resistance mechanisms. Mm. And we had a very simple trial design. Essentially, if you knew you had one of these organisms in the blood, you were randomized either to piperacillin-tazobactam or meropenem, which is a carbapenem. And then you had that drug for a period of time, and then we followed everybody up for one month, 30 days, mm -hmm. and the primary endpoint was whether you lived or died. Um, Straightforward. So we, very, very simple. <laughs> and ultimately, that's what, as a physician, you really care about. Right. You know, if you have a severe yeah. infection, you can measure all kinds of surrogate markers, but ultimately you want to know, are you going to survive or are you going to die? Right. And it's also unambiguous. There's no mm -hmm. sort of like argument about it. You're either yeah. alive or yeah. you're dead. Um, but we also measured things like resolution of sepsis, fever, white cell count, that sort of thing, just to get some idea of uh, you know, how these drugs are acting in a patient with these sort of bloodstream infections. Um, and what we found, in fact, we were, to be honest, we were kind of hoping that we would find these two drugs were equivalent. Mm -hmm. So we did what was called a non-inferiority yeah. trial. So essentially saying that Piptazo is no worse than meropenem, which is, I guess, the sort of standard of care. And we had a, a, a margin of 5% for mortality that we would allow, but anything more than that, mm -hmm. we would say would be inferior. And I think my sense, and my sense from the observational literature, was that they were probably going to be the same. Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually not what we found. <laughs> and I think this highlights the importance of doing a randomized trial, because in fact, we found quite a significant difference in the primary outcome for mortality. How big was this gap? So, um, in fact, we had to stop the trial early. So, at the third interim analysis, uh, we noticed that this gap was very significantly different. Mm -hmm. And when we analysed the complete cohort of 378 patients, um, the difference was 8.6%. So it's absolute risk difference. And that equates to about a number needed to harm of about yeah. 12 which is and it easily not, get into you can't ethical sniff at. Yeah, exactly. And in fact, we felt, we worked out that in fact, we had a target sample size of about 450. Mm -hmm. Even if we had enrolled to that target, we would never be able to demonstrate non-inferiority. In fact, we would have had to have no more deaths in the Piptaz arm and almost yeah. everybody die in yeah. the other arm, yeah, right. or 25% or so, yeah. a massive increase in mortality, it's not very which likely. was never going to happen. Yeah. And in fact, we felt it was probably unethical to keep randomizing mm -hmm. patients with that knowledge. Right. Uh, so it was a kind of stop for futility and this superiority signal. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, the, the, it equates to a, a relative risk of about 3.4. Um, and you know, our, my feeling is that data is actually quite compelling that in these patients, particularly those that have more severe disease, and we looked at some subgroups of those that had you know, severe sepsis, more complicated source of infection, uh, the risk is actually even higher. Um, and I think part of the reason we found this increased risk in the entire population was because we were recruiting from many countries that right. They're different sort of patients that we might see in Australia. Yeah. They're often presenting later. 
they may have more mm -hmm. more comorbidities. Mm -hmm. um, they're you know they may not have such easy access to intensive care facilities mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, I, my sense is that's where a lot of this has been driven. Mm -hmm. um, and in a way, that's what we need to know because yeah. you don't is want that the to real just, world exactly. Isn't it? You don't want to just do studies in nice tertiary centres where right. everything's fantastic yeah. and yeah. you know patients get fan beautiful care yeah. and there's every yeah. machine available to you and doctors around the clock. Yeah, you know the real world happens elsewhere. Um, so honest, it is a, in a way a bit of a disappointing result, mm -hmm. but I think it highlights to me the sort of studies we need to be doing to really answer these questions. And I think that we really need to try hard to seek these sort of carbapenem sparing alternatives, mm -hmm. but test them in a very rigorous way yeah, yeah. so that we don't sort of fool ourselves into, in, in, by relying on data that can be biased or, or a bit unreliable. I think it's fair to say that it has a great impact on the clinical work in the future and even right now, your research, what you did, and uh, especially you did it without any special funding, as I know. You, Yes, from so I mean, pharmaceutical companies. So you just did it not only by your own. Sure, but sure. I mean that, and I think that the, the real, I think the real lesson for me, at least, was the power of collaboration. And mm -hmm. I think things like ECMID is a fantastic place to meet with like-minded colleagues. I mean, this trial really came about from. Um, I, I really must credit firstly David Patterson, who is uh, the chief investigator for this study. He's worked in antibiotic resistance for many, many years and did some of the original observational studies of meropenem back in the 1990s, mm -hmm. but has always been wanting to do this randomized trial. And the great thing about David is that he knows everybody, <laughs> he's worked with everybody in the world, yeah. and uh, he was probably the ideal person to bring this group of people together. And I'd also like to credit Paul Tambaya in Singapore It was a real catalyst. I've actually worked in Singapore for a year. Mm -hmm. And we discussed this study and the idea for the study, and he kind of made it happen in Singapore. And I think that combination of sort of getting, you know, in influential people in the antibiotic resistance world on board and keen brings everybody else together, and everybody lent their time and effort and, uh, and you know, their research staff to make this happen. And we managed to do this with some funding, but you know it was university funding or little grants here and mm. there. And I think it sort of shows that you can do this kind of thing. Yes, if Just you a have like a role model, what you did. Oh, <laughs> too kind. <laughs> but no, but I think it, it's. I think it, I think maybe we've thought these things are too hard to do, and they mm -hmm. are not easy to do. Mm -hmm. But they are possible, I think, with the right mix of people, the right clinical question. And I think also the trick is designing a study that resembles clinical practice as closely as possible. So you're not having to do anything too extraordinary. You're not having to measure blood levels every five minutes or do lots of expensive tests. Yeah. You're basically doing what you would normally do, mm -hmm. but you do it in a more systematic way and you collect the data very carefully and you, 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 you randomize whatever the question that you're trying to address. And, and I think that's to my mind, a model for the sort of studies we could be doing in the future to try and address these, these problems. You at least demonstrated that it is possible. Great work, great presentations, all the best to you. Well, thank and you. Thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure. Dr. Harris, thank you. Thank you.